Chapter 1 Bob sat back as Griselda cleared the table after the Cauldron family dinner. Griselda was Pop's new housekeeper, well, relatively new. She'd been working for him since Grams had died two years before, but she still felt like a new addition to Sunday dinners at the main house. They all liked her, but she didn't quite fit into the family dynamic the way Grams had. Pops looked at his six grandsons, all born within five days of one another, and said, let's head into the living room. I want to talk to all of you. Bob knew the groan he withheld was being echoed in the minds of his two brothers and his three cousins. They'd all six been raised by Pops and Grams when their parents had gone on a weekend retreat to the Bahamas and died in a plane crash together when the boys were five. And really, his cousins were biologically his brothers. The family was strange for certain. He and his two brothers were triplets, and his cousins were triplets. Their mothers had been identical twins, and so had their fathers. So biologically, that meant they were all siblings, but they were really cousins. As a geneticist, he knew the odds of triplets born to two sets of identical twins was infinitesimal, but it had happened, and he and his brothers and cousins were living proof. They all moved into the living room to obey their grandfather, a man all six of them had the utmost respect for. If they hadn't respected him so much, they'd have run for the hills, as they all knew this lecture would be about carrying on the family line, something none of them had jumped to do as of yet. As soon as they were seated in the large space, Pop started talking, and even though they all knew what he'd be talking about, they paid rapt attention, trying to act like they cared. That was how much they loved him. Even if they didn't care about the same things he did, they could pretend, and they did. I'm sure you're wondering why I called you all in here, Pop started. Not really, Wyatt said, but the others glared at him, and he grew quiet. Wyatt was firmly against marriage and having a family. Pops acted as if nothing had happened. He was used to all six boys and their temperaments. When your parents died, your grams, and I took you in without a hesitation. We knew that you six were the future of the ranch, and in some ways, you proved us right. All of you work hard for the ranch and for our annual rodeo and race. You are the best six grandsons a man could ask for. However, Wyatt said, immediately quieting down when his three cousins and two brothers glared at him in unison. He knew he was supposed to sit quietly through these lectures, but he never seemed to be able to. Pops once again pretended Wyatt hadn't spoken. However, as much as you boys have done for the ranch with your skills and your hard work, you have disappointed me in one aspect. If your grams knew that none of you were married yet, she would be rolling over in her grave. Here it comes. Wyatt mumbled. This ranch has been in the Cauldron family since 1855. For those of you who can't do math to save your lives, and no one is staring at you, Jim, that's 165 years. I'm starting to think that if I want this ranch handed down to my great-grandkids, I'm going to have to adopt some. When are you boys going to get married? Start making some kids? I'm ready to be a great-grandpops, and you're making it rather difficult by not marrying. Wyatt opened his mouth, but Deck kicked him. Bob frowned, wishing someone else would say something but since this was the fifth lecture of that sort since January, he knew it was time to do something drastic. I plan to be married within a few weeks, Pops. He could feel every eye in the room on him as he said the words. He hadn't yet told anyone of his plan, but it was perfect for him. The man whom he'd been named after, narrowed his eyes at him. You've been dating someone and haven't introduced her to me yet? When are you bringing her home for Sunday dinner? Bob grinned. I talked to a matchmaker after this lecture two weeks ago. I am going to be introduced at the altar. Some lady back east runs a business called Matrimony, and she's bringing me a bride. Wedding is in two weeks. He wasn't looking at his brothers or cousins when he made his little announcement, but he knew if he had been, they'd all be looking like they were trying to catch flies in their mouths. Pops glared at him for a moment. Are you serious, boy? Very serious. 
I'll marry whomever she brings me, and we will live happily ever after, and there will be many more babies to run around the ranch. You satisfied now? Bob was sure his news would make Pops feel much better about the fact none of them were married yet. Pops shook his head. No, I'm not going to be satisfied until every single one of you is married and has given me a grandbaby, or six. This ranch is meant to have children running all over it. Isn't there a camp field trip coming here next month? Wyatt asked, unable to control his tongue once again. There'll be kids all over it then. Pops joined the others in glaring at Wyatt that time. When Deck kicked Wyatt this time, Pops said, a little harder there, Deck. Deck laughed and happily obeyed. He was always willing to kick a brother or a cousin. He didn't care which. All right, I want all of you to think about marrying. Soon. I'm getting up there in years and I want to be young enough to bounce my great-grands on my real knees, and not the replacements I'll need before too terribly long. You hear me? Five of the men nodded, but Wyatt stuck his chin out belligerently. He never planned to marry, and they'd all known it for years. There was a crash from the kitchen, and Pop sighed dramatically. I wonder what Griselda broke this time. She probably tripped over her feet when she was trying to make you the best dessert you've ever tasted, Ted said with a grin. She has a crush on you, Pops. Don't be silly. Women do not have crushes on men my age. Pops glared at Ted, but they all knew better. Griselda had a crush, and she was hot to trot for Pops. None of them wanted to think too hard on it though, because E.W., but it was hard not to know. Maybe you should try to father those kids you want to repopulate the ranch, Jim said. You're not too old to have more kids. Pops rolled his eyes and went to the kitchen to see what had happened with Griselda. They could hear him using a soothing tone with her, as the six cousins looked at one another. Bob shook his head. I probably shouldn't have told Pops my plans yet, but I didn't know what else to say to get him off our cases. Wyatt shook his head. He's never going to be off our cases. Well, not mine anyway, because I'm never getting married. Jim frowned at Wyatt. You're being a pill tonight, Wyatt. I'm open for marriage if love finds me, but I'm not sure it ever will, so I'll just leave it at that. Jim trained the horses that Bob bred. They raised the best horses in the country when it came to horse racing. Bob was a geneticist, and he was careful about lineage. Ted shrugged. I don't care one way or the other really, so I'll get married if the right girl comes along. Ted was the only one of the cousins to live in the big house with Pops. He was the manager of the ranch, always crunching numbers. Bob looked at his cousins. He'd heard from his brothers, Jim and Ted. Now it was time to hear what the others were doing. Deck had been sitting quietly through it all only kicking when certain people needed to be kicked. I've always wanted a dozen kids. I'm in. Cade looked at his brother as if he'd grown horns. Since when? Since always. The fact that you didn't know I wanted kids has more to do with you not paying attention to me than anything else. Cade crossed his arms over his chest. I pay attention. He took a deep breath. I guess if everyone else is looking for brides, I should look for one too. No reason for me to sit back and watch the rest of you marry. I guess. Maybe. Bob could tell his cousin wasn't sure what he really wanted, but he'd play along for now, since everyone else seemed to be. Wyatt didn't wait to be asked. I'm still not getting married. I don't care what you all do. I know marriage is not for me. Bob felt a corner of his mouth pull upward in a half grin. What do you boys want to bet that Wyatt's married before the rodeo is over in September? If it didn't happen quick enough, he was happy to nudge it along in the right direction. I'll see whatever bet you put down, Wyatt said. I'm not marrying no way, no how. I have a thousand dollars down to start. Wyatt was the gambler of the group, and the others all knew it. He rarely lost a bet. Bob grinned. 
I'll see that thousand. I'm not marrying this year or next. It's not happening, and if you think it is, you're nuttier than a squirrel. Pops walked back into the room then, and sat down in the chair he'd ignored earlier. She dropped a dozen eggs, and when she tried to catch the last one and keep it from falling on the floor, she knocked a bowl off the counter as well. I swear, I miss your grams more with every minute I spend with that woman. Ted frowned. Give her a chance, Pops. Just because she's not grams doesn't mean that she's not worth loving. Pop's eyes looked sad when he answered. When you found the love of your life and had fifty years with her, you know you can't settle for anything less. No, I'm not marrying again, no matter what you fool boys say. Bob shrugged. We just want you to be happy, Pops, and whatever that takes is what we are looking for. He got to his feet. I'm heading home. We have a stallion coming in tomorrow from Rush Creek Ranch, and I want to breed him to Lilac Lady. They're going to have the fastest foals in all of Montana. I'm sure you're right, Pop said. No one ever questioned Bob's ability to breed the fastest horses around. Good night. Bob called as he headed out the back door and across the ranch. He only wished he could study his prospective bride's bloodline the way he had the horses. He wanted to make sure his children were as well-bred as his horses. Asterisk. Tessa walked into the principal's office and sat down in the hot seat across from his desk. She and Keith had dated for three years before he'd announced he was going to marry her sister. This was the third time she'd been called into his office in as many weeks. Yes, Mr. Burton? I've had a parent complain about you once again, Miss Stanton. Tessa knew better, but she also knew that he was trying to force her out of her job. Her sister hated the idea of the two of them working together now that they'd split up. Is that so? Keith nodded. It is. Little Jeremy Sellers' parents think you're not doing all you can for him. Tessa closed her eyes. The complaint was probably real. Little Jeremy Sellers' parents refuse to believe he is a low-functioning autistic and will probably never speak. They have very unrealistic expectations for what speech will do for him. She kept her voice calm, and she was proud of that fact. Maybe they do, but they don't feel like you're doing all you can to help him. They are against him using a device that will speak for him in school, and yet you've made it part of his IEP. She sighed. It's the only way he can communicate. If they'd be open to him using one at home, he could actually respond to them when they talk to him. They're refusing to give him the chance to communicate, and I only have his best interests in mind. She'd argued with Jeremy's parents until she was blue in the face. He needed to be able to communicate, but he couldn't verbalize. He shook his head. You need to work with the parents and do what they want for their child. Even if what they want isn't in his best interest? How am I supposed to live with myself if I don't take care of the boy? She asked. He would spend his life in solitude if he couldn't communicate, and Jeremy responded so well to the assist device. I don't care whether you can live with yourself or not. You do what the parents want you to do, and that's all there is to it. I'm going to have to write you up again. Tessa got to her feet. Of course, you are. Why don't I just give my resignation? I'm sure you've been interviewing people to take my place anyway. He nodded. Of course, I have. I knew you'd stop doing your job properly as soon as I asked your sister to marry me. She closed her eyes and counted to ten. You know, if you'd been dating her for three years before you asked her to marry you, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. Instead, you dated me for three years and then asked my sister to marry you. Isn't that a little bit odd? She didn't wait for an answer. My resignation will be on your desk first thing in the morning. I'll work out my two weeks, but nothing more. There was no way she could continue to work with him with the way he was treating her. She left his office and walked down the hall to her best friends. Knocking quickly, she opened the door. 
Joy was the only counselor for the K-8 school, and she and Tessa had been best friends since grad school. Tessa sat down across from her friend and waited for her to look up from the paperwork she was so intent on. What happened? Joy asked as soon as she saw Tessa's face. You look mad. I just tendered my resignation. One of the parents complained that I'm not doing my job properly, and I'm putting things into IEPs that they don't want. Joy closed her eyes and shook her head. Don't tell me. Jeremy Seller? I was in that IEP meeting with you, and they refused to believe that having a device speaking for him was the best thing for him. They'd rather he couldn't communicate at all. I know. He's locked inside himself with no way to express his needs without that machine, and they refuse to see it. They say I'm not doing my job properly because he's in third grade and can't speak. They sent me a letter last week, and I offered to meet with them, but instead they talked to Keith. Tessa stood up and paced in the tiny room. I'm ready to scream. I don't blame you, but what are you going to do? You need to work, because it keeps you alive. I've seen you work with all the kids, including little Jeremy, who is learning so much from you, and you couldn't be happy without them. You know it as well as I do. Yeah, I'll start throwing resumes out like candy, I guess. I have been anyway, but I've been trying to focus in Illinois. Now I don't care where I go. I just need to be away from here. Besides, if I have to sit through one more family dinner with that man leering at my sister, I might just scream. Joy smiled. I don't blame you. She pursed her lips. Any thought of marrying? Marrying? The only serious boyfriend I've ever had is marrying my sister. How could I possibly be thinking of marrying? Tessa was sure that Joy had lost her mind. Well, at a convention last month, I met a woman who introduces people at the altar. I think she'd have you set up quickly. Are you serious? You want me to marry a stranger? I'm just saying it's something to think about. You've been talking about how you're ready to marry, and I think it's a good idea, even if you don't. Joy wrote something on a piece of paper and handed it to Tessa. Think about it. I'll be your maid of honor. Tessa reluctantly took the paper and stuffed it into the only pocket she had on her dress, her bra. I'll think on it and let you know. I can't believe I'm even considering it. I'll grab a pizza and bring it to your place tonight, and we'll watch Gilmore Girls all night. It'll be good for us. Tessa nodded. That sounds like a good idea. I'll stop and get ice cream on my way home, and we'll pig out on crap all night. That's what I need right now. She left her friend's office and walked back to her own. Just one more hour and school was out for the week, and she wouldn't have to see Keith until Sunday at dinner with her family. She didn't want to ever look at him again, but that wasn't exactly possible with him being her boss and marrying her sister. She pulled the paper out of her bra and read what was written there. Dr. Lachille Simpson Matrimony, followed by a phone number. Before she lost her nerve, Tessa made a call. I'd like to speak with Dr. Simpson, please. This is Dr. Lachille. You need your head shrunk, or do you want to get hitched? Tessa sat for a moment, wondering what to say. Finally, she just hung up. There was no reason for her to stoop low enough to get married to someone she'd never seen before. She was an attractive woman with a good job and an excellent education. When her phone rang, she answered it quickly. This is Tessa. Tessa, didn't your mother ever teach you not to hang up on people? This is Dr. Lachille, and I take it you want to get married. When can we meet? Tessa sighed. I don't know where you are, but I'm in Illinois. Never been to Illinois. I've been to Missouri, Wisconsin, and Kansas, so all around you. I'll come there. How's tomorrow? I, I'm not sure that I really want to go through with it, Tessa said. No time like the present to find out. Give me your address. The voice on the other end of the line was soft, but very authoritative. 
Tessa took a deep breath, nervous about the whole situation, but she could always say no after she met the woman. She rattled off her address. I'll be on a flight tomorrow, and I'll see you probably sometime in the afternoon. My interview process takes about eight hours. Be ready. The phone went dead. Tessa rubbed her hands over her face. What had she done? Chapter 2 It was after ten in the morning when Tessa woke up the next day. There was a mess from her night of revelry with Joy, and she immediately started cleaning. She hadn't mentioned talking to Dr. Lachille to her friend, and she wasn't sure why. She wasn't ashamed of it, but it felt weird. She was just starting the dishwasher when there was a knock on the front door of her little rental house. Hurrying to the door, she opened it wide, coming face to face with a middle-aged woman with purple hair. I hope you're not mad, but I ran over your mailbox. I have someone coming out to fix it. You ran over my mailbox? Her mailbox wasn't even a little bit in the road. The woman would have had to drive up on the curb to hit it. Tessa peeked outside to see it, and sure enough, it was completely knocked over. Sure. It's kind of what I do. I'm Dr. Lachille, by the way. Can I come in and put you through the most complete series of psychological tests in the known world? Um, Tessa didn't know how to react, which didn't seem to phase Dr. Lachille at all. She just walked in around her. How did you hear about me, by the way? My best friend Joy is a school counselor, and she said you two were at a conference together last month. Dr. Lachille nodded. Oh, yeah. I was teaching about how to handle kids when they feel their lives are over after a breakup. It was a fun class. Sounds like it. Dr. Lachille walked into the living room, sank down in Tessa's favorite chair, and motioned for Tessa to sit. Let's get started. I can't wait to know what's going on inside your head. Asterisk. Exactly two weeks later, Tessa stood at the back of a church somewhere in Montana. Since she'd made the phone call to Dr. Lachille, her life felt like it was a snowball rolling down a hill straight for a busy highway. She was scared to death, but it didn't seem to matter. She was getting married. Dressed in the most beautiful dress she'd ever seen, Tessa sat in a chair, impatiently waiting for Joy to finish with her makeup. You're going to be so beautiful when I'm done with you. Joy said. Of course, you're already the most beautiful girl I know, so it's an easy job. You don't have to try to flatter me, Tessa told her friend. I'm here, and I'm apparently going through with it, though how I got talked into this, I will never know. I've never even been to Montana, and here I am moving in. What's wrong with this picture? Not a thing. I think you're doing the best thing you could possibly do. And you never know, maybe your groom will have a handsome brother to take me away from all my troubles. Joy grinned at the idea. I wouldn't count on it, Tessa said. The door opened, and Dr. Lachille hurried into the back room. Are you ladies ready? Wedding starts in 15 minutes, and the bride is not supposed to be late. There was a woman behind Dr. Lachille, whom Tessa had yet to meet. Dr. Lachille hurried to Joy, crying out, Booby bump. After hugging both of the girls she waited for her answer. We're almost ready, Joy said. Don't worry, just a few coats of lipstick and the world will be ready for us. Or maybe we'll be ready for the world. One of those. Dr. Lachille grinned. All right. You two stay where you are. I need to go talk to your groom. Don't you just love Cauldron Valley, Montana? I grew up not too far from here, and I swear Montana is the most beautiful place in the whole wide world. With that, Dr. Lachille hurried from the room, the girl who seemed to be shadowing her right behind her. I wonder who was with her, Joy said as she finished Tessa's makeup. No telling. The woman is crazy, you know. Tessa still wasn't certain why she was trusting the insane purple-haired woman to match her with someone, but she was obviously doing it, or she wouldn't be at the church. She is that. I think that's why I like her so much. 
Makes sense to me, Tessa said. I just hope my groom showed up. If he didn't, he'd face Dr. Lachiel's wrath. Do you think there's a man alive that brave? Tessa didn't respond, because they both knew the answer to the question. There was no man alive brave enough to face the wrath of Dr. Lachiel. She was sweet, and had a little fairy voice, but everyone could see there was a little bit of a wildcat deep inside her. Asterisk. Bob sat wearing his tux and waiting for the wedding to finally start in the pastor's office. It was the same church he'd gone to since he was a tiny boy, and he felt right at home, though it was a little odd to be in the pastor's office when he hadn't done anything wrong. It wasn't like he'd put cellophane on the toilets in the women's bathroom at the church, this time anyway. The door opened and Dr. Lachiel flew in. Good, you're here. You're ready? She asked Bob. I am. This is my brother, Ted. I was going to have both of my brothers stand up with me, but Jim refused to wear a monkey suit. Poor guy. Bob looked at the woman behind Dr. Lachiel. Are you my bride? The woman's eyes widened and she shook her head sharply. No. Oh, heavens no. This is Jamie. She's just here to watch me do my thing. Dr. Lachiel looked at Ted. It's nice to meet you, Ted. I'm always looking for more men to match up, so if you ever want to marry, have Bob give you my number. Yes, ma'am, Ted said, looking a little intimidated. All right. We're going to the front now, boys. You two need to take your places, and then I'll cue the music for your bride, Bob. She looks absolutely gorgeous today, and I expect you to tell her at your first opportunity. You hear me? I hear you. Bob followed the woman out of the room meekly, wondering why she intimidated him so much. She was a short little thing, and he couldn't think of any reason why she would be the least bit scary. He went to the front of the church and stood beside Ted, who leaned over and whispered. You put your fate in her hands? What were you thinking? I don't know what I was thinking, except that it would get pops off my back. Bob shrugged. Anything is worth that, right? Anything. The music started then as Griselda started pounding on the keys of the church's piano. Griselda had been playing piano there for as long as Bob could remember, and he knew she'd never married. He didn't remember her throwing herself at pops before but he had to wonder if it had been happening while Grams was alive. He felt bad for Grams if she had been, but she seemed so nice. He felt Ted's elbow in his ribs and looked at the back of the church. He swallowed hard. A beautiful blonde was walking toward him in a wedding dress, and there was a girl beside her. Why was there a girl walking his bride down the aisle? That made no sense at all. He supposed he'd have to ask her later if he remembered. When she reached him, Bob leaned over and whispered, You look absolutely gorgeous, and I'm not just telling you that because Dr. Lachiel told me I had to. His bride grinned at him. She's bossy, isn't she? Yes, but apparently she did a good job with us, because we're agreeing already. Bob was thrilled to have an agreeable bride. He could see them sitting on his front porch swing every evening after she finished the dishes and she would tell him about how fun it had been doing the laundry, and he'd talk about his horses. Then the pastor started speaking, and both of them were quiet. Ted pretended he lost the ring when it came time to slip it onto his bride's finger, and Bob elbowed his brother in the gut. His bride looked a little startled, but then she grinned as the elbowing got him the wanted response, and he slid the ring on her finger. When the pastor told him he could kiss the bride, Bob couldn't remember what her name was, but he was all for the kissing part. He'd figured they'd wait a month or two before consummating the marriage. Now he wasn't sure he wanted to wait an hour or two. She was awfully pretty, and she got his motor running. He took her into his arms and lowered his head, watching as her eyes closed. His lips touched hers, and he felt like he was going to explode. Whatever her name was, she was the woman of his dreams, and he didn't even have to know anything else about her to know that. 
Come to think of it, he didn't know anything about her at all. A kick from Ted had him breaking off the kiss and glaring at his brother over his shoulder. Stop that. Bob told him. He looked back at his bride, who looked shell-shocked. He wasn't sure why, but he was all for it. That kiss had left him weak in the knees. As they walked to the back of the church, Griselda caught up with him. Your pops had me arrange the reception. It'll be waiting for you in the fellowship hall. Bob groaned. I didn't say I wanted a reception. Your pops apparently didn't care. He shook his head and opened the nearest door at the back of the church into one of the Sunday school classrooms. His little bride was looking at him curiously. Is that your grandmother? Or your mother? Neither one, he said. That's the housekeeper who has a crush on my pops. No more explanation was needed in his mind as he caught her around the waist and kissed her again, this time deepening the kiss and crushing her against him. He had to wonder if anyone would notice if they consummated their marriage right there and then. It took him a minute to feel her hands pushing at his chest. I thought we should get to know each other a little better before we started getting frisky. He groaned, but she was right. He should at least know her name. Yeah, probably. I didn't catch your name. The ridiculousness of the situation struck Tessa, and she began to laugh. She clutched her stomach as tears ran down her face, and she had to lean against a wall to keep herself upright. Bob stared at her as if she'd lost her mind. What's so funny? She just kept laughing until her ribs ached. I, and you don't, my name. She couldn't get the words out, but she hoped he understood. Pardon me? he asked. She laughed even harder, finally letting herself slide down the wall in her wedding dress, landing in a heap on the floor, still laughing. Um, my name. Your name. I got that part. She sucked in a breath, trying to still the laughter as he stood over her, watching her as if she'd lost all her faculties. The kiss. Finally, Bob just sat down on the floor with her and took her hand in his. You don't mind if I hold your hand as you get yourself under control, do you? She shook her head. Finally, when she'd calmed herself, she said, Never in my life have I let myself be kissed that way, and here I am, kissing a man like my life depends on it, and he doesn't know my name. Bob grinned at that. Well, when you look at it that way. The door opened, and Dr. Lachille popped her head in the room. I thought I heard a crash. My little bride was laughing so hard, she knocked over a chair. Tessa bit her lip as the laughter threatened again. I didn't even notice. Dr. Lachille shrugged. You two have fun. I'll go entertain everyone at the reception. Maybe I'll sing. That tickled Tessa again, and the laughter once again started as the door closed behind Dr. Lachille. Oh no you don't, Bob said. I still think that was a little extreme of a reaction for the situation. He shook his head. At least she had a sense of humor. He liked that in a woman. Maybe a little, Tessa said. She took another deep breath to calm her nerves and said, I'm Tessa. I'm Bob. Bob Cauldron. Like the valley? He nodded. The valley was named after my family. Strange I know, but that's how it is here. He'd always felt a bit like he was the crown prince of the town, and his brothers and siblings were lesser princes. He was the oldest, after all. Very strange, she agreed. Tell me about Bob then. What do you do for a living? Well, I work on the ranch where I was raised by my pops and grams. I'm a geneticist, and I specialize in horses. We raise champions on our ranch. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a horse geneticist. Are you involved in the actual breeding of the horses? she asked. Yup. I'm involved in every aspect until the foal is born, and then it goes to my brother Jim, to train. Who stood up with you? Had that been Jim? 
that was my brother Ted. Jim is our middle brother, though really, there's not much need to keep track of birth order, because Jim, Ted, and I are triplets. Triplets? Really? I've never even met a triplet. Well, you'll meet six before the night is out, because we have triplet cousins who are five days younger than we are. Tessa stared at him quizzically. You're joking, right? Two sets of triplets five days apart in the same family? Was that even possible? We don't joke about triplets around here. This county is very superstitious, and they think triplets are bad luck, so when we pass them, they lick their fingers and raise them to the sky as if they were doing the whole Mockingjay thing like they did in Hunger Games. It's creepy if you want the truth. That sounds very creepy, Tessa said. Are you kidding? He had to be kidding. There was no way people did that. I'm really not joking. You'll see it at the reception, I'm sure. It's bizarre. I hope they don't touch anyone after they lick their fingers. Is no one afraid of germs? She hoped no one would touch her after licking their fingers. It's not like there's a pandemic going on. I don't think it's a big deal. I guess, she still thought it was strange, and she hoped the licking fingers thing wouldn't extend to the wife of a triplet. I guess triplets run in your family? Multiples run in my family, he said. Both my mom and dad were identical twins. Monozygotic twins are not supposed to be hereditary, but I'm not sure anyone has studied my family. Really? That's craziness. Yeah, and my aunt and uncle were their twins, so my cousins are actually my biological siblings, which is more than a little bizarre. Tessa shook her head. This is starting to make my head hurt. She hoped he was joking with her, because she wasn't sure she could handle it otherwise. Oh, don't worry. You'll understand it all soon. He got to his feet and held down his hand to help her up. Let's go meet our loyal subjects. Our loyal subjects? Are you king around here? She was sure he'd lost his mind now. Bob grinned. You could call me King Bob. But no, I just always wanted to say that, and what better day than your wedding day? Tessa raised an eyebrow. None, I guess. The man was a bit, odd. Still, he seemed nice enough. Together, they walked to the reception, and the people waiting there cheered as they walked in. Bob bowed, which was strange, so Tessa curtsied. She could outstrange the man any day. They passed an older man and woman, and sure enough they licked their fingers and raised them in the air. Tessa looked back at Bob, and he shrugged as if to say it was mostly normal. She was certain she'd never be able to get used to it though. Dr. Lachille motioned them to a table at the front of the room, and as soon as they were seated, waiters and waitresses started serving food. Tessa leaned over to Bob. I just agreed to marry you last week. How did you plan all this so fast? He shrugged. It was Griselda. She's amazing as long as Pops isn't around. When do I get to meet this pops person? He's sitting on the other side of you. Tessa turned to look at the older man sitting to her left. Hello, pops. I'm Tessa. It's nice to meet you, Tessa. You have wide hips, and that will be good for carrying babies. He studied her, but she saw the twinkle in his eye and wondered if maybe he was joking. She certainly hoped he was. Um, I'm not pregnant. That's not why we married fast. Oh, yeah, the old man said. I knew that, but it'll happen, because I need a bunch of great-grandsons to carry on my family name. What if I only have daughters? Tessa asked, narrowing her eyes. Then I'll love them just the same, Pops declared. She smiled and nodded, glad he saw things the same way she did. She noted that people were walking in front of them, and they all licked their fingers and raised them in the air. Those people are creepy. Get used to it. Bob said. One man stopped to talk to them, and he had Crayola crayons woven through a long beard that was halfway down his chest. 
So, you finally found someone willing to saddle herself with you. Bob nodded. Sure did, Clyde. Beard's looking good. I'm going to win Culliest Beard for the sixth year in a row at the county fair this year. I don't care who thinks different. Clyde stroked a hand over his beard as if making sure the crayons were still in place. I don't know. I think Steve is going to give you a run for your money. Bob grinned at Tessa, who had absolutely no idea what was going on. The man glared at Bob and walked away. Why does that man have crayons in his beard? Tessa asked, leaning toward Bob. She had never seen such a thing. Bob shrugged. He's trying to beat his brother in the county fair for the culliest beard. Doesn't your county fair have a culliest beard contest? Um, no. I've never heard of anything like that. That's weird. You think it's weird not to do that? I'm a little worried about living here now. Are you sure you don't want to run away together and live somewhere else entirely? Tessa couldn't imagine why anyone would think it was weird not to put crayons in a beard. What had she gotten herself into? I can't. How would I keep the bloodline going strong on the horses if we lived somewhere else? Bob was right where he needed to be, and no woman was ever going to get him out of the valley. No idea, she said. I literally have no idea about anything anymore. Is this the Twilight Zone? Am I dreaming about my wedding to the stranger Dr. Lachille set me up with? She was attracted to Bob, but the world he lived in was a little bit too strange for her tastes. Nope. This is your welcome to Cauldron Valley. It's an amazing place, and soon you'll fit right in. I hope so. Truthfully, she hoped she would never fit in with the band of misfits she saw around her, but she didn't want to hurt his feelings by saying so. She looked out over all the people at the reception and she noticed two men, who were identical to one another walking through the hall. They stopped to talk to two young women who immediately licked their fingers and held them up in the air. I'm not sure I'm ever going to get used to it though, and even if I do, it might give me nightmares. Who was superstitious about triplets? Chapter 3 The reception lasted late into the night, and Tessa noticed that Joy was dancing a lot with a man. Of course, she was busy herself dancing with Bob and trying to figure out why there were so many odd people there. And why Bob thought they were all normal when they were obviously insane. After the reception, he took her out to his pickup truck. Wait. Don't you have a suitcase or something? Dr. Lachiel said she'd have my belongings transferred to your truck during the reception, so everything should be in the back. She glanced over her shoulder, trying to see if it was there. Well, I won't mind if she forgot. It'll give you an excuse to run around with nothing on, and I think I'd like that more than a little bit. Oh, I'm sure you would. Speaking of me being naked, I think I want to get to know you for a little while before we're intimate. It was a difficult topic to bring up with her new husband, but she knew she needed the time. He frowned at her. He'd been about to back out of his parking spot and take her home and make love with her. What was she thinking? I don't think that's a good idea. We need to make love tonight to consummate the marriage. His mind raced as he tried to come up with a reason they needed to consummate immediately, but truly there wasn't enough blood in his brain, because it was rushing elsewhere, and he was having a hard time thinking. No, we can wait a little while. She sighed. You don't want an unwilling woman in your bed, do you? Honestly, I wouldn't mind that a bit, but I have a feeling you'd mind, so I guess we won't tonight. He groaned. How long are you going to make me wait? Not forever. We just need to get to know one another. Surely, he'd understand that. I thought we did that in the Sunday school room at the church. Before the reception. We met each other there. It takes a little while to get to know one another. I suppose you think you need a honeymoon too? He shook his head. I was just going to take a week off work but you want to go somewhere? He should have known that letting a woman get close would mess up all of his carefully orchestrated plans. 
she frowned. I'm not trying to make your life difficult. I need to quit being annoyed with you because you want to wait to have sex. I know I do. He took a deep breath and smiled at her. Do you want to go on a honeymoon? I'd rather not go anywhere too far, but we could do something. He really wanted her to say no, because he knew he'd have a better chance of getting her to sleep with him faster in his little house. Yellowstone? she asked. I've always wanted to go, and we can't be too terribly far away from it. He nodded. The parks are packed at this time of year, but I do have a buddy that works there. I'll see if he can get us a place to stay. We'll have to stay at my place tonight, though. Where do you even live? Tessa asked. She was about to go home with her new husband, who was a virtual stranger, and she had no idea where he lived. This was so surreal. Perhaps contacting a matchmaker hadn't been the right thing for her to do. I live in a little house on the ranch, he said. My brother Ted, the redhead who stood up with me, lives in the big house with Pops. Jim has a house on the ranch, and so do two of my cousins. Where does the third cousin live? she asked. Bob smiled. My cousin Wyatt lives in an apartment off of the ranch's racetrack. Did I meet Wyatt? she asked. She couldn't keep all of the cousins apart in her mind. Yup. You met them all. Kate and Deck are identical, and Wyatt is the cousin who doesn't look like the other two. I'm surprised you and your brothers don't look more alike, she said, as he finally pulled out of the church parking lot. It's kind of weird. I'm the oldest, and I have dark hair. Jim is in the middle, and he's got blonde hair. And Ted is a redhead. Wyatt and Ted look almost identical, and they're cousins, but they're brothers biologically, as I've mentioned. It's all kind of crazy. Tessa nodded. And a little scary to be honest with you. I'm not going to have multiples if I get pregnant, will I? She loved children, but doubling up didn't sound like it would be fun for anyone. Who knows? I sure don't. I just think it's fun that we have so many of us the same age. We made up half the football team in high school. What position did you play? she asked. He seemed too intelligent to play football to her. Quarterback. What else? Of course. Tessa wasn't sure what else to say. He seemed like quarterback material. What does that mean? he asked. She shrugged. Just means that it's about what I expected. She looked out the window as he slowed. Are we at the ranch? She couldn't wait to have time to explore the whole thing on foot. Or maybe horseback if she could talk one of the men into teaching her to ride. She'd been a horse-crazy tween, but her parents had never let her ride. He nodded. Yeah, this is a side road onto it. The ranch is huge, but this little portion of it is mine. The other houses are away from us, so we'll have our own sweetheart retreat back here. As long as there's a porch swing, I'll be happy. There's a porch swing. I can't wait to spend quiet nights sitting with you there. Right after she finished the dishes of course. He couldn't let her get away with shirking her womanly duties. Thanks for being willing to make a honeymoon out of it. There's not a reason for you to stay here, is there? Our prize mare is expecting twins in September, and we need to worry about her, but for now, it should be all right. I plan to be on hand when she goes into labor. He was more concerned about her than he wanted to let on. A mare having twins was a lot more difficult than a woman having twins. They were all worried about her. If you need to stay, we can do a honeymoon at another time, she said. He parked the truck in front of a small house. I appreciate that, but I can get away for a week. She's in good health, we just know that losing her or either of her foals will be hard for the ranch. Those babies are worth more than I can express. And you love her too, don't you? She could hear it in his voice as he talked about the mare. It was so sweet to see a big cowboy like him completely in love with a horse. It made him seem soft to her. 
Moonbeam? Of course, I love her. We all do. She's a pretty special mare. He opened the door and got down, walking around to open her door, feeling strange as he did, but she was in a wedding dress. It couldn't be easy for her to climb in and out of his truck. Did you bring a car? Tessa shook her head. No, my friend Joy is going to drive it up after school is out. School? Is she a college student? Bob hadn't thought her friend looked quite that young, but he hadn't spent a lot of time studying her either. No, she's a school counselor at a school in Illinois where I'm from. We were co-workers, but we met in grad school. You have a graduate degree? He asked, surprised. Yeah, I'm a speech therapist. I resigned a couple of weeks ago. So, you could marry me, he said, and she didn't argue with him. She wasn't sure she was ready to talk about Keith and her sister at the moment. He walked to the back of the truck and grabbed her two suitcases. This is all you brought? That couldn't be enough for her to keep going until her things arrived. Most women wore more makeup than he could fit into both bags. School's out in two weeks, and my car is packed as full as it can be. Joy will drive it up then. That makes sense. It was smart of you to do it that way. He just hoped she didn't feel the need to go out and buy everything in town to see her through. I thought so. She walked toward the house, curious about the place where she'd be living for a while. She wasn't sure if she would want to stay on the ranch with his entire family, but they could talk about that at a later date. Stopping at the porch swing, she gave it a nudge and smiled when it started swinging. There would be many romantic nights spent there with her new husband. He opened the door for her, and she noted that he didn't bother with a key. She completely understood because the small town she was from in Illinois was just the same. No one locked their doors, because they knew everyone in town. He set her suitcases down just inside the door, and he flipped on a light. The door opened into a living area, and there was a kitchen and dining area off to her left. They were separated by a breakfast bar, which she was sure she'd use often. May I explore? she asked. She was trying to be polite by asking, but she was already in the kitchen, poking through the cabinets. Do you cook? He didn't really seem the type of man to cook, but he had enough food in his house that she was sure he must. He nodded. Yeah, I cook. It was that or eat at the big house every day, and that was no good, because it almost hurts to see Griselda throw herself at Pops. I can understand that, she said, moving down a hallway, where there was a bathroom and two bedrooms, one of which was obviously his. She walked through his bedroom and found a connecting bathroom, with a deep tub. She was looking forward to taking three-hour baths in there. It would be the perfect place to light a couple of candles and read for hours. She walked back out to the hall and looked in the other bedroom. That room only had a twin bed, and there was a computer desk in there. Is this your office? she asked. He nodded. I use it as a home office. I also have a small office in the breeding barn, and I do most of my work there. She nodded. I'm sleeping in here tonight, I think. It would be perfect for her until she was ready for sex with him. He sighed dramatically. Are you sure I can't charm you into my bed? He asked. I know your name now. Tessa laughed. No, I don't think that's a good enough reason to go to bed with you. She shook her head. How many men could use a line like they knew your name to get you into bed with them? Only someone like Bob would even try that tactic. Fine. He looked toward the front of the house. Is there one suitcase you need more than the other? If I can arrange it, we'll leave in the morning, so you probably don't want to unpack both of them. I'd like the smaller one. She had a pair of pajamas and some casual clothes in there. Good enough for one night. He went and got it, setting it at her feet. You're absolutely sure, he asked again. Yes, I'm absolutely sure. Tessa stood on tiptoe and kissed him. Good night, Bob. 
he frowned. Good night, Tessa. He went into his room and closed the door behind him. As soon as he was gone, Tessa wished she had access to the bathtub in the master suite, but she could wait for that until they had a real marriage. The next week or so would be all about getting to know one another. She put her suitcase on the bed, opened it to grab some pajamas, and headed into the bathroom for a quick shower. She was simply thankful he had two bathrooms, and she would have her privacy. Asterisk. Early Sunday morning, Bob knocked on the door to his office. When Tessa opened it, she was in a pair of pink pajamas, and he could see the outline of her nipples through the thin material. He started to look away, but then he remembered they were married. She may not want him touching, but he had every right in the world to at least look. Yes, Bob? Tessa wanted to fold her arms over her breasts when she realized where he was looking, but it would feel like a retreat, and she wasn't ready to retreat from him just yet. She would stand strong. I arranged a place to stay near Yellowstone. We'll have to be in West Yellowstone and not in the park, but that shouldn't be a big deal for us. Bob was just glad he'd been able to find something relatively close. Sounds good to me. When do you want to leave? He shrugged. We have reservations for tonight through Saturday night. We can go now and make a long leisurely day of it. Sounds good. I can be ready in fifteen minutes. He raised an eyebrow as if he didn't believe her. You don't have to be that quick. I know most women like to take their time getting ready. Not all women. Don't lump me in with other women you've known or dated. She closed the door in his face and quickly stripped, changing into shorts and a t-shirt. She grabbed her hairbrush and a scrunchie and put her long blonde hair back into a ponytail. When she finished, she snapped her suitcase shut and reopened the door. Five more minutes, she said, hurrying into the bathroom and brushed her teeth. Bob was in the living room when she walked out. He'd obviously gotten comfortable, expecting it to take her hours to be ready. Would you mind putting my suitcases in the truck? She asked. She could do it, but why be married to a big hunk of a man if he wasn't going to help her with little things? He nodded. Sure, I'll do that while you get ready. I am ready. Bob looked at her and saw she was dressed, her hair up, and she even had her shoes on. You really are ready. Stop expecting me to fit some stereotype you have of women, and let's go. She hurried out the door and jumped in the passenger side of the truck, though she thought about demanding his keys. She'd never driven a pickup truck, but it sounded fun to her, though she wasn't sure why it did. She was sure it would be harder to navigate into narrow parking spots than she was used to. He climbed in beside her after throwing luggage in the back. I packed for myself this time, he said as he pulled out of his driveway. I figured you could wait a little while before you started that wifely duty. She gaped at him for a moment. You expect me to pack for you? Don't you know how to ball up your underwear and throw it into a suitcase? Had the man lost his ever-loving mind? Well, sure I do, but wives always pack for their husbands. You have some very weird ideas about marriage. What were your parents like? She wasn't about to get into an argument about who would be packing for whom at this early date in their marriage. Nah, it was better to wait until after the honeymoon to set him straight. He shrugged. Honestly, I barely remember them. They died when I was five in a car wreck on their way to Costa Vida, and we never saw them again. They were with my aunt and uncle, who died as well. That's really sad. So, your grandparents raised you? He nodded. Yeah. We'd always lived close, so it wasn't a big transition. We were staying with them when it happened. I can honestly say it was a much bigger deal for us when Grams died. He still missed his grams every single day, while he barely remembered his parents. Which explained his antiquated views about marriage. He'd been raised by his grandparents. She'd have to slowly train him as to what to expect in a modern marriage. 
hopefully it wouldn't take too terribly long. I'm sorry for all of your losses, she said softly. Since you didn't have time to cook breakfast before we left this morning, I was hoping you wouldn't mind if we stopped somewhere, he said. I thought you said you could cook, she said, looking at him. Why would he expect her to cook when he was perfectly capable of doing it for himself? She hoped it wasn't something like the packing thing. Well, sure, but I never will have to again, because you'll be cooking for me. He had no grin on his face. He didn't seem to be joking. Tessa felt her heart jump into her chest. This was crazy. Wow. Just wow. She had never in her life met a man with so many anachronistic views about marriage. He was going to take some serious training. Sure, I can cook sometimes, but you can cook sometimes too. Why would I cook? You're going to be home all day, so you'll have plenty of time, he said. It only made sense for her to cook, because she wouldn't be working. Why would I be home all day, she asked, really not understanding him at all. I will in the summers, sure, but during the school year, I really hope I'll have a job in the area. He stopped the truck right there in the middle of the road, and turned to look at her with surprise. You plan on working? The look on his face was priceless. He'd obviously never considered the possibility of his wife working outside the home. I didn't go to grad school, to sit on my butt all day and knit. She didn't even know what to do with knitting needles except maybe poke him in the gut. She could do that. Grams knitted, and she never once complained. She made me sweaters every single year for Christmas. Why did she have a problem with knitting? And that's fine if that's what she wanted to do. What I want to do is do the work I spent six years in school for. She said a silent prayer that he would understand the difference. If he couldn't there was something seriously wrong with him. But you don't need to work now. I make enough to support us. She'd never have to work again, and he was sure once she realized that, she would be thrilled instead of arguing with him about it. He was giving her a gift. A honk from behind them had him putting the truck in drive and starting down the road again, though the person who passed them glared at them before licking their fingers and raising them in the air. She closed her eyes, not believing the argument she was having with her brand new husband. Bob, women work, and it's okay if they want to. I enjoy my job, and I love working with children, so I'm going to keep working. He stopped the truck again. But you don't have to work. Surely, she'd figure out that he was making her life easier by allowing her to stay home. No, I don't have to work, but I want to work. I hope you can see the difference. Tessa shook her head. And you have got to quit stopping your truck in the middle of the street. Someone is going to rear-end us. He put the truck back into drive. I just never imagined you'd want to work when you don't have to. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. I love my job. I don't want to stay home and make your suppers. I'll make you a deal. I'll cook all summer long, while you're working and I'm not but when we're both working, we can take turns cooking. It sounded fair to her. But you don't have to work. She laughed softly. No matter how many times you tell me that I don't have to work, I'm still going to want to work. I love working with children with speech problems. I don't understand. I can see that. As you get to know me better, I'm sure the light will shine brighter and brighter until the light bulb goes off over your head as if you're a cartoon character. Tessa had never had a discussion with someone quite as dense as Bob was being, but he was obviously a very intelligent man. I'm not so sure of that, Bob said, frowning. This marriage wasn't starting off the way he'd expected. Chapter 4 After a quick breakfast, Bob and Tessa headed toward Yellowstone again. What exactly do you want to see in Yellowstone? he asked. Tessa shrugged. I don't even know. Hiking could be fun. I want to see the geysers. Old Faithful sounds amazing. I want to see the Upper Falls. 
I saw a picture of it from a friend who had gone, and it looked incredible. I just want to experience the wonder that is Yellowstone, and see real live bison running around like they did once in our country. I just want to experience what I can, and it sounds like a perfect place to get to know one another better. Bob nodded. All right. He was still trying to figure out why she wanted to work, but he wasn't about to bring it up again. It made her all prickly for some crazy reason. We're going to stay in West Yellowstone, Montana, which is a short drive from the park. It's also very touristy. If you want to buy something that says Yellowstone on it, you'll find it for sure. I'm looking forward to it, she said. Growing up in the middle of Illinois, I saw a lot of wheat fields, corn fields, and cows. I need some variety in my life. Bring on the bison. He grinned. You're really excited about Yellowstone, aren't you? Her enthusiasm was contagious, and he was excited to go with her, even though he'd had no desire at all to go on a honeymoon. Yes. This is something new for me. I'm sure you've been a million times, but I've never been, and I really want to go. She was practically bouncing in her seat, she was so excited to see all the things she'd read about. I haven't been a million times. I think we went four or five times growing up. Kind of like how you never do the tourist stuff in your own town. I feel bad that we haven't, but someone had to run the ranch. Now with so many of us working together, we have time we can take off to do other things. I'll help you make up for it. I want to do all of the tourist stuff. She forgot to be annoyed with him for a moment as she thought about how exciting it was to live in Montana. I hope I never look at a mountain and forget to be in awe of its grandeur. He grinned at her, pleased that she was so happy to be there. So, you're a teacher, right? She shook her head. Not really. I'm a speech therapist. I work with kids who are having a hard time learning to talk. Sometimes it's just children with lisps or who pronounce their R-S as W-S. Sometimes it's kids who don't speak at all because of some sort of trauma they've been through. She shrugged. I work with kids who are autistic, who might never speak, but I find a way for them to communicate, usually with a machine that they can tap the right word on, so they can tell you what they want. It's challenging work, but I love it. It sounds like it would be a real challenge. He didn't tell her again that she didn't have to work anymore, because it seemed to annoy her, but he hoped she'd understand soon. He wasn't willing to talk about it on their honeymoon, though. This was a time for them to get to know one another and simply enjoy each other's company. I can't wait to see Old Faithful, Tessa said. I've seen photos, and it looks absolutely amazing. It's like all the other geysers, he said. The best thing about Old Faithful is that it goes off regularly. The others aren't as easy to predict. The scientists at Yellowstone always know within a few minutes when Old Faithful will erupt. You're willing to go there with me, right? Tessa asked. Of course. I haven't been to the park as an adult, and I can't wait to see everything all over again. I'm sure I'll see it all through fresh eyes and enjoy it even more than I did as a kid. Do you know your way around? Bob shook his head. Not at all. I seriously remember very little about it, and it'll be like I'm going for the first time again. We'll have to pick up a map. He was sure there were maps of all the amazing things to see there. I can follow a map, Tessa said gleefully. It was afternoon by the time they got to West Yellowstone, and they immediately checked into their hotel. He'd booked a loft room, and he was lucky to have gotten it. They had to climb a flight of stairs to get into their room, and Tessa carried her own suitcases up without thinking about it. She was used to doing for herself. Bob frowned at her. I'd have gotten those for you. She shrugged. I know, but I don't need help with them. I am perfectly capable of carrying my own possessions. She wouldn't mind letting him help, as long as he knew she didn't need him to. It was all about being strong enough to do things on her own. Are you always going to be this independent? He asked. Probably. 
She grinned at him, looking through the first room, which had a queen-sized bed, a loft bed, and then in the second room was another queen bed and a kitchen. This is a nice little place. I don't want to cook a lot on my honeymoon, though. She could of course, but she couldn't see a need when there were restaurants all around them. She'd be cooking enough when they got back if what he'd been talking about had been any indication. I promise not to expect you to cook until after the honeymoon, he said with a grin, expecting her to be thankful that she was getting a break from cooking so early on. I'm sure we'll be sharing the cooking as soon as we're back on the ranch. For now, we can both take a break from it. He shrugged. It's not a man's place to cook. He sat down on the bed, stretching his arms above his head. I'll nap while you get everything unpacked, and then we can have a quick lunch out somewhere. Does that work for you? Sure, Tessa said with a tight smile. She'd unpack her own things, but she wasn't going to do double work and unpack for him simply because he thought she should. She wanted to get her hands on his grams for teaching him that it was a woman's job to do everything around the house. When she finished doing all of her own unpacking, she walked to the window and looked out at the people walking around. This was obviously a big tourist destination. She walked into the main room, seeing Bob sound asleep, but instead of stopping there, she took the stairs down and left, wanting to explore the quaint little town. It seemed like a good place to visit, but she wasn't sure she'd want to live there. It was a little too crowded at the moment. And to have an economy based on tourists? She wouldn't like that at all. As she walked down the main street of town, she wandered in and out of several tourist shops, buying herself some t-shirts and crystals. As she left the third shop, she glanced at the time on her phone and realized she'd been gone for more than three hours. She hadn't meant to wander quite so much, but she hadn't wanted to disturb Bob's nap either. She realized only then that Bob didn't even have her phone number, so he couldn't get in touch with her if he'd wanted to. Oops. Well, she hadn't wanted to deal with Bob after he'd told her to unpack. That was the truth. Walking as quickly as she could through the crowds, she hurried back to their room and used her key to get in. Climbing the stairs, she found Bob sitting on his bed, phone in hand. You were gone for hours, he said, glaring at her. I was worried. Sorry, I lost track of time. I love tourist shops, and I got involved in what I was doing. Why didn't you wake me to go with you, he asked, looking hurt. If you were too tired to unpack your things, I thought you were too tired to explore with me, she said, trying to look innocent. Was I wrong? He frowned. You didn't get my things put away. You only did your own. Well, of course I only did my own. We're not even sleeping together yet. I don't want to embarrass you by handling your underwear. She smiled sweetly. He shook his head. You have an answer for everything, don't you? Tessa grinned. Usually. Have you eaten? He asked. I'm hungry. Not yet. Why don't we go see if there's a place that sounds good near here? There's a lot of stuff open, and we could just walk until we find something. She liked to walk and explore, and she was glad she'd done it without him. Men could be pains about shopping. All right. He stood up, grabbing his wallet and keys from the nightstand. Let's go. Together, the two of them walked down the street the way Tessa had just been, stopping at a quaint little restaurant that looked like it was decorated in an Old West theme. This look good, he asked. She nodded. Food sounds really good at the moment. After choosing their meals, they talked, the conversation stilted. It was hard to sit with a stranger you were married to and act like everything was just fine. So, you went to school to be a geneticist? Yes, but I did my best to focus on the bloodlines of animals, and particularly horses. I have a doctorate. I still do a lot of research on each of the animals I choose, wanting our bloodline to be the best. Are there horses and cattle on your ranch? There are a few cattle. My brother, 
Jim, trains the horses to be able to work with cattle as well as just for racing, so we have to keep a few around for those purposes. We don't make much on the cattle, because that's not our focus. She nodded. How long has the ranch been in your family? Since 1852. My great-great-great-something grandparents went west on the Oregon Trail, and they settled here. They knew some old neighbors who had come out the year before, and they decided this was where they wanted to settle to be close to them. I'm not even sure which family it was. It's a nice area. Or seems to be anyway. She took a sip of the water that had been put in front of her. Did you ever think about breaking away from the ranch and doing something on your own? He shook his head. Nope. I never did. I love being able to work with my family the way I do, and we can all take turns watching out for pops this way. Griselda is going to faint dead away at his feet one of these days and expect him to sweep her away on a white stallion. She laughed softly. How long have you known Griselda? My entire life. She's really a nice lady, but she never married, and I think she had a crush on Pops even when Grams was alive, but I can't prove it. The very idea bothered him. Did she start working for him right after your grandmother's death? She worked there for a few months before Grams died. Grams had breast cancer, and we all knew she was not going to survive, so she hired Griselda and taught her how she did things around the house. Grams thought it would help Pops transition to life without her better, but I don't think it worked. He still misses her something fierce. Didn't you say they were married for over fifty years? Of course, he misses her. She was a permanent part of his life, and it would be devastating to lose someone after so many years together. Bob nodded. It was for him. We all try to be around and let him know we're thinking of him and still love him and stuff but it's still really hard. We do Sunday dinners with the whole family usually, and you'll get to know my brothers and cousins there. Which brother are you closest to? And which cousin? He shrugged. We're all pretty tight. Kate and I work closest together, because he does the feed for the horses. He actually grows his own feed, and he makes sure it's just right for our horses. He grinned at her. Grams always said there was something in the water, because no matter what one of us decided to do, we were great at it. Cade sells his horse feed to other ranchers in the area, and he's even starting to market it nationwide. What's so special about it? Tessa asked. She'd had no idea there were different feeds for horses. Didn't they just eat grass? I'm not really sure, but it makes the horses grow bigger and stronger. They have no health issues at all. There's just something almost magical about it. What do your brothers do? She asked. I think you told me, but let's face it, we've talked about a lot in the past 24 hours. He nodded. And my family is a little stranger and more complicated than most. Jim trains the horses. He's dyslexic and never did well with school, but I swear to you, he's a horse whisperer. It's like they know what he wants them to do, and so they do it. It's that simple. She smiled. Maybe he can teach me to ride then. I've always wanted to learn. Bob frowned. I'll teach you to ride. I'm not a horse whisperer, but I sure know which end is which. Tessa shrugged. I don't care who teaches me as long as I get to learn to ride a horse. No problem. Ted does the books. He can stretch a dollar in a way no one else in this world can. He'll come up with an idea for income for the ranch, and the next thing I know, we're making a ton of money from nothing. It's crazy. Sounds like you all have your strengths. Have you ever bred two horses that didn't do well? She asked. He seemed to be very confident in what he did, but most professionals had some failures. He shook his head. Never. Every mare and stallion I've put together have rendered a champion colt. And my Mara's never failed to get pregnant either. We don't keep any stallions on property, but I always bring one in for breeding purposes. 
I don't want bloodlines mixing, so I make sure all of our male horses end up as geldings. It helps us keep things straight. Do you have a favorite horse? she asked. I've never really spent much time around horses, but I am fascinated by them. I was one of those girls who went horse crazy, while other girls were going boy crazy. Favorite horse? I think it's Moonbeam. She's currently pregnant with twins, which is not super safe for a horse. We're having to monitor her really closely, and Kate is working on a feed specifically for her. That's really cool. I'm glad you all work together so well and make things happen. I couldn't work with my sister for all the tea in China. You have a sister? What's her name? Lindsay, and I don't want to talk about her. Tessa wasn't sure she could talk about her sister without spewing all the negative feelings she had for her all over Bob. She still couldn't believe her own sister would steal her husband from her. Of course, it didn't matter now that she was out of Illinois. Bob frowned. It was the first subject she hadn't been willing to talk about with him. All right. Tessa smiled. My friend Joy came with me for the wedding yesterday. Joy is a lot of fun, and she's the one who will be driving my car back after school is out. I look forward to getting to know her then. She made a face. Do you think it would be okay if she stayed with your grandfather when she comes back? I don't feel like our house is big enough for a guest at this point, but I'd love to have a little more time with her, if you don't mind. Pops would love that. And you should call him Pops too. Everyone does. I'd like that. My grandparents all died before I was born, so it will be nice to have a grandfather. Don't call him Grandpa or Grandad or anything though. He only likes to be called Pops, because to him, Pops is a much cooler grandfather. Tessa laughed. He sounds like a good man. Oh, he is the best man I've ever known. After my dad and uncle were killed by cannibals in Africa while they were there for the Peace Corps, he became more serious. He never planned to raise six boys on top of the two he'd already raised. Grams told us to never talk about it with him, and we never did. Wait, your parents were killed by cannibals? Didn't you tell me they died in a car crash? Bob frowned. Well, my grandparents were never willing to talk about how they died, really, so the six of us have always made up different ways they died. It's our way of coping. Every time I talk about my parents dying, I say how I think they died at that moment. Today feels like they were killed by cannibals on a peacekeeping mission. Don't you want to know the truth? Tessa asked. The truth is my parents died when I was five. I have very few memories of them. Knowing how they died won't change anything. Talking to Pops about how they died will just make him sad, and he's sad enough now that Grams died. I'll just keep making stuff up, and all will be fine. Okay. Tessa didn't really understand why he didn't want to know the truth, but he did seem content making stuff up whenever he was asked. She was sure Joy would have a field day with him. What do you want to do tonight? He shrugged. You know what I really like to do when I have downtime? She shook her head. I like to work on a jigsaw puzzle. There's a decent-sized table in our room, so why don't we get a puzzle from one of the shops and go back and work on it? It's too late to go to Yellowstone tonight, anyway. All right. I enjoy puzzles too, and I saw a few that had Yellowstone scenery in the shops. That would be a lot of fun, and we could talk or not, get to know each other while quiet and while talking. Sometimes you learn more about someone when you don't talk to them, than you do when you are talking. I guess. Bob shrugged. I just feel like doing a puzzle. She was making things way too complicated for him. Then let's go get a puzzle. She watched as he paid the bill for their meal, and the two of them walked back toward the hotel, along the way stepping into one of the shops and buying a puzzle. She couldn't wait to get started. Chapter 5 The next morning, Bob and Tessa woke early, planning to get a quick breakfast in town, before heading to Yellowstone. 
When Bob woke, he got a shower and then immediately woke his wife. I want to leave within the hour, so I thought I'd wake you so you could get ready. She nodded, going immediately into the bathroom, which still had steamed mirrors from Bob's shower. It was strange living in such a close space with someone else, but she was certain she'd get used to it. When he wasn't insisting she act like his grandmother had, Bob wasn't a bad man. There were definitely things to work through, but they'd get there. She hoped. After breakfast, they headed into the park, and Tessa tried to look in every direction at once. Mainly what she could see was simply a heavily forested area, but she wanted to get out and explore immediately. She knew it wasn't safe, but it didn't seem like a dangerous place. She spotted a bear off in the distance and squealed. There's a bear. There are lots of bears in Yellowstone, Bob said calmly. And bison. And moose. You want to stay away from all three, because they could each kill you. I'm sure they could. I'll be careful. Where are we going first? We'll head toward Old Faithful first. I think if you saw nothing else here, you'd want to see that geyser, and I'd like to walk the lower geyser basin, but we'll do that after. He was surprised to find himself actually excited to show this place to his sweet wife. She was special, and he wanted to move the earth for her. Is it a long walk? she asked. Tessa loved hiking, but it had been a long time since she'd had the chance. She was sure she'd be sore for a few days, but she didn't care. She was getting to see things she'd only dreamed about. Not too long. We can keep it short and just hike next to the pots, but if you're up for a bit of a climb, we could go up and see the whole area from a different trail. Let's see how I feel then. I haven't done a lot of walking recently and I don't want to die on my first day here. Die, huh? You're not being melodramatic? Never, she said with a grin. I'm extremely level-headed. Ask anyone. I don't have to ask. I can see it for myself. He drove into the parking lot closest to Old Faithful and was able to find a spot a good distance away. This is where you'll see Old Faithful and there's a place to eat here and even a shop or two. You're never going to get me out of the shops, she said, teasing him. Women love to shop. Bob responded, teasing her back. She narrowed her eyes at him, growing serious. Don't paint me with the same paintbrush you use on other women, please. Get to know me first. He was starting to make her crazy with his blanket statements about women. He frowned, but he realized she was right. He wasn't getting to know her, and he was expecting her to act a certain way, because other women did. That wasn't fair to her at all. I'm sorry, he said. I'll do my best to not do that again. I appreciate it. She was pleased, he understood what he'd done wrong finally, and she didn't resist when he took her hand and walked with her. Every time she started to think their marriage could work, he did something else that was stupid. Hopefully, they'd make it through the day. There's already a crowd gathering to see Old Faithful, but that's normal. We're not going to be able to avoid that, so let's join the crowd and watch it erupt, and then we'll do the shopping you want to do. Sounds good to me. She didn't love crowds, and she really preferred it when people practiced social distancing but she joined the throng of people waiting for the geyser to erupt. She wished she could get closer, but the huge crowd of tourists blocked her view. When the geyser erupted a few minutes later, she wasn't disappointed though, and was instead filled with awe as the geyser shot water straight into the air. When the short eruption was over, she and Bob headed toward Old Faithful Lodge. They're renovating the lodge, and I have a friend who's part of the project. It's pretty amazing from the pictures he's posted on Facebook, but I'm excited to look at it for real. Will we see your friend? she asked, looking around them. He shook his head. No, he didn't have time today, and he didn't want to interrupt my honeymoon. He was glad John hadn't wanted to join them. He didn't want to have to share his beautiful wife even for a minute of conversation. I can appreciate that, she said. The entire place was lovely. 
From there, they walked into one of the tourist shops, and she grinned. So many of these things were in West Yellowstone as well, but she wanted to support the park by buying their overpriced souvenirs there. She rubbed her hands together, anxious to get started. By the time she'd finished gathering the mementos she wanted, it was time for lunch. He led her back to the restaurant in Old Faithful Lodge. Are we going to spend more time inside shopping than we do outside on the trails? he asked. He wasn't really bothered by her time in the shop, but he was curious about how she ticked. Tessa shrugged. Maybe. I hate normal shopping, but put me in a souvenir shop, and I'll spend all day wanting to get just the right things to remember my time by. You hate shopping? You mean like grocery shopping, right? I bet you go shoe shopping all the time. Bob couldn't imagine a woman who thought she had enough shoes. Every friend he'd ever had always complained about his girlfriend and her need to have hundreds of pairs of shoes. You know what? I don't like shoe shopping at all. I find it annoying and aggravating. I buy shoes when I absolutely need to, and I still wish you'd quit comparing me to every other woman you'd ever known. She took a sip of her water as she watched him. Would he realize he was being a jerk? She certainly hoped so, because if the man wasn't teachable, he would have to be pushed off a cliff somewhere. She couldn't make it the year she'd agreed to in matrimony's contract. You're right. I keep doing that, don't I? He shrugged. With all the women in town being afraid of me because of the triplet thing, I've never really had a relationship. I was too busy at college to even try for one, and when I got back to Cauldron Valley, the women were still afraid of me. She looked at him as if considering his words for a moment, before nodding. That makes a lot of sense actually. Not ever having a relationship would mean you had no idea how to deal with women. You're going to have to let me teach you. He shrugged. Sure. If that makes you happy. He was sure he did well in his dealings with women, but if she thought he needed to work on them, he would. No questions asked. He wanted nothing more than to please his beautiful bride. Trust me, it will make me very happy. Then I'll learn all I can from you. He was determined to make her happy and keep the family name going. Pops needed great-grandbabies, and he was the only one who was married. He'd make sure they happened. After a very long day of hiking, shopping, and eating, they returned to the hotel room, and she collapsed onto her bed. Her feet ached, and she pulled one onto her lap to try to rub it. You need a foot rub? Bob asked. He had immediately gone to the table to work on the puzzle some more. I do. She never would have asked, but if he was offering, there was no way she'd turn him down. What woman in her right mind didn't want a foot rub from a handsome man like Bob? He sat at the foot of her bed, pulling one of her feet into his lap. He peeled her sock off and applied pressure to her foot, trying to find the spots that hurt her. He'd never given anyone a foot rub before so he hoped he was doing it right. That feels good. Thank you. He smiled, keeping up the pressure. This was the first time they'd been on a bed together and the most he'd ever touched her. He couldn't help but wonder if he could turn this into something more. Did you have fun today? Tessa nodded. It was a good day. I feel like I know you better, and I got to see a lot of Yellowstone. It's an amazing place. I can't believe we were in a traffic jam today that was caused by a herd of bison. I guess in my head they're extinct. They're really not extinct at all. Yellowstone can only handle so many of them, so they actually have to ship off part of their herd frequently. They go to other protected areas, but there are even ranchers who raise them instead of European cows. Since they are the only cattle indigenous to North America, they don't need all the immunization and things that the European animals do, and they end up being healthier for human consumption. She smiled. I love that you know things like that. If I want a dog, will you research its lineage for me? She'd wanted a puppy for years, but she'd never been in a position to have one. 
if you need me to. He shrugged. I'm pretty good with human genealogy as well. I studied some of the genetic experiments they did on the Amish to keep from inbreeding. It was pretty fascinating. Do the Amish allow themselves to go through genetic testing? She asked, surprised. Bob nodded. They do. They don't want to risk having any of their people become sick because they married too close of a relative. That's really interesting, Tessa said. I guess your knowledge is good to keep around. He laughed, tickling her foot. Be nice to me. I'm your favorite husband. This is true. Of course, you're my only husband, so that would make you an automatic favorite. Also, a least favorite, if you think about it. Hopefully, I won't have another anytime soon. Bob frowned. Aren't you going to swear that you'll never marry another man as long as you live? I've known you for two days. I think that may be a bit premature. Tessa wiggled her foot, reminding him to keep rubbing it. She wasn't going to promise anything ridiculous for his ego. That's true. But I don't think Pops will ever marry again. He was married for 50 years and presumably loved your grandmother even before they married. You and I have known one another for 48 hours. I think there's a big difference, don't you? He shrugged. He was surprised how much he wanted her to tell him she would only love him and no one else for the rest of her days. He hadn't really been worried about how she felt about him before they met, finding the whole meeting at the altar thing more of a genetic experiment than anything else. Now that he'd done it though, he was surprised at how much his feelings came into play. When he'd finished with her foot rub, he crawled up to the head of the bed, stretching out beside her, both of them with their backs against the headboard. Did I do all right? he asked. The foot massage, she asked, looking over at him. At his nod, she said, you did great. She was surprised at how needy he seemed for compliments. Thanks. Do you need one? He shook his head. Not at all. I thought a little canoodling might be fun though. Canoodling? she asked, raising an eyebrow and giggling. How can you say that word so seriously? He shrugged. No idea, really. My grandmother used to say it, so I guess it's just a normal word to me. Before meeting her, he'd never realized just how old-fashioned his upbringing had been. Being raised by his grandparents had definitely given him some antiquated ideas about things, and definitely an antiquated vocabulary. Well, I like it. She turned toward him, putting her palm flat on his chest. Thanks for a good day. I really did have fun. I did too, he said, surprising himself. He thought he was only going to Yellowstone to appease her, not to enjoy himself. It turned out, just being in her company made him happy. Don't look so shocked, she said, grinning at him. He dipped his head and leaned down to her pressing his lips against hers. She had been eating a small piece of chocolate she'd gotten in the park, and he could taste the sweetness on her lips. Deepening the kiss, one hand went to her waist to pull her closer to him. He wanted so much from her, but he knew it was too early for them. She would never allow him to make love to her yet. And she'd refused to negotiate a date. Tessa wrapped her arms around Bob's neck and kissed him back with everything inside her. She'd had a wonderful day with him, and his touch made her knees weak. She stroked her hand along the side of his neck, enjoying the feel of his hot skin against her cool hands. He pulled her against him more completely, his lips roaming from hers to lightly kiss her neck. She tilted her head to give him better access to the skin there. Finally, Bob sat up looking directly into Tessa's eyes. If you're going to stop me, then you need to stop me now, he said. Tessa debated with herself for a moment, before she finally shook her head. I'm not ready. She wanted to keep going, but she knew she'd regret it later. He groaned. I was afraid you'd say that. I'm sorry. I just want my first time to be with someone special to me and you can't be special if I've only known you a couple days. 
Your first time? He asked. You've never? She shook her head. No, I always said I'd wait until I was married, and I know we're married, but it doesn't feel right yet. If we'd had time to get to know each other before the wedding, I'm sure I'd have slept with you on our wedding night. But you don't mind if I keep trying, right? Are you asking for permission to canoodle with me at a future time? She asked, grinning at him. He nodded. Yes, I guess I am. Yes, Bob, you're welcome to try again. I'm sure soon the answer will be yes, but it doesn't feel right tonight. All right. I understand. He got out of the bed and walked back over to the puzzle. Come over and play puzzle with me some more. We have fun doing that. Tessa smiled and joined him at the table, each of them sitting in the chair the other had been in the previous night. She loved seeing the puzzle from a totally different angle. Bob too for that matter. He may make her crazy at times, but he was always good to look at. Asterisk. On the last full day of their trip, they hiked the trails near the lower falls, and Tessa felt at peace as she stood looking out over the beauty of the waterfalls with Bob at her side, his arm around her. It's so powerful, she said, and he could barely hear her over the sound of the falls. It is. I feel like Yellowstone shows us God's raw power in ways other places don't. Here we see the falls, and we've stood at so many geysers watching water spew into the air. Truly, this is an amazing place. We'll come again. He wasn't sure why he hadn't been enamored of the place as a child, but it probably had to do with being there with his brothers and cousins. They'd always fought when cooped up together, but they loved each other more than words could express. I wish we could come every weekend, she said softly, then she shook her head which is absolutely unrealistic, and I realize it. It is, but we can at least come every year. They turned and walked back down the path to the truck, and he could still see how awestruck she was by the beautiful experience. Now we just need to see a moose. We've seen bears, been stuck in bison jams, but no moose. Are they hiding this year? She laughed, shaking her head. I'm sure we'll see one before we're out of the park. I'll watch, and you go super slow. Like there's any other way to drive in Yellowstone, he said softly. Just before they reached the gates, she pointed off to the right. Three moose. Our trip is now complete, he said, grinning over at her. Their easy camaraderie of the past few days filled him with hope about their relationship. After a leisurely supper, they returned to the hotel, and Tessa headed for the shower right away. It was time, and she wanted to be nice and fresh-smelling for their first time together, instead of smelling like she'd spent the day hiking. When she came out of the bathroom, she was wearing a thin nightgown she'd purchased when she knew she was going to be getting married, knowing she would eventually want it. Bob was sitting at the table, putting the last few pieces into the puzzle they'd worked on every day for almost a week. You're almost done, she said softly, when she came to the conclusion he'd never look up and see how she was dressed if she didn't speak to him. Uh-huh, Bob said, putting another piece in place. He glanced up and saw her wearing a flimsy, soft pink nightgown. He felt as if he'd swallowed his tongue, her appearance having rendered him completely speechless. He got to his feet and walked to her as if mesmerized, taking her into his arms and pulling her close to him. Words weren't needed after that, as he lowered his head to hers, kissing her with passion. Her arms went around him, and she clung to him as he caught her by the waist and lifted her, one of her legs on either side of his hips. He lowered her to the bed and his hands roamed over her body. If her nightgown wasn't an invitation to make love, he didn't know what was, and he wasn't about to ask her if she was sure. No, he was going to take advantage of the situation before she changed her mind. His hands stroked over her nightgown and toyed with her nipples, smiling as they tightened into buds under his fingertips. Her hands roamed over his back and he groaned with pleasure. This woman set his body on fire like no other, and he couldn't wait to join with her, finally consummating their marriage. It had been far too long in his opinion, 
but hopefully this was the start to a new part of their marriage. His hand went between her thighs, and he stroked the tight bud he found there, one finger sliding inside her to test her readiness for him. He got to his feet, throwing clothes in every direction as he stripped. Tessa had only eyes for his erection, which made her gulp hard. He was a large man, and she wasn't sure she was ready for him, but this first time, she would simply have to trust him. He rolled atop her, and when his member found her core, she let out a gasp as he entered her. The feeling of fullness was too much, and she wasn't sure if she could bear it for much longer. Bob could see the pain on her face, and he leaned down to kiss her softly, his hand going between them to stroke her more and help her adjust to him. When her legs wrapped around his hips, he knew she was ready, and he began the slow thrusts that were the mating dance he'd wanted to share with her since the moment he'd laid eyes on her. Finally, she was his wife in every way. When he groaned with pleasure as his seed flowed into her, she clung to him, feeling the same thrill he did. The last thing she thought as he tucked her against him for sleep that night was that she shouldn't have waited so long. Bob made her feel special, 